Yesterday, we have witnessed a very educative lecture uh, of Dr. Abhijit Ghosh from University of California. Uh, this morning, let us brace ourselves for yet another uh, educative and uh, enlightening lecture from the Dr. Jean Hurtbeck from USGS USA. Uh, we are privileged to have with us uh, Professor J.R. Kayal as the session chairperson. Now, may I request Professor Kayal to say a few words. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Anesha. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Jenny. Good morning. And good morning to all participants. And good morning, Santanu. Good morning to Anesha and all. I think uh, I have nothing to say except to look forward to listening to the speaker. What a wonderful topic. I think this topic is close to everybody's heart and we'll all try to understand the physics behind it in more detail from your today's lecture. So thank you very much, Jane, for you know accepting our very humble invitation and uh, to share your experience and knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Please, you can please start. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, may I request uh, Dr. Timansha Chetia to read out a short biodata of Dr. Jean Hurtbeck. Oh. Uh, namaste and a very warm good morning to one and all in the IVW GST 2022 family. I take this opportunity and it's my privilege to read out the brief biodata of Dr. Jean Hardybeck. Dr. Hardybeck is a renowned research scientist in the uh, Quick Science Center of USGS, USA. Dr. Hardybeck received a BA in computer science from Cornell University in 1993. She completed her MS in geophysics in 1997 and PhD in geophysics in 2001 from California Institute of Technology. She has a wide research interest, which includes crystal stress and the strength of faults, earthquake statistics and testing earthquake forecasting methods, California stress field and seismotectonics, earthquake triggering and effect on probabilistic seismic hazard assessments. She is professionally an experienced researcher with many postdoctoral scholarships. She has published more than 78 papers in journals, conferences and reports. She has also won the Charles F. Richter Early Career Award Seismological Society of America in 2006, James B. McElvin Medal, American Geophysical Union in 2007, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2009. Last but not the least, this is just a very brief biodata of her research and knowledge endeavors. Thank you, Dr. Jean Hardybeck and one and all present here. Over to Anvisha. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Timanshu. Now, uh, I'd like to request uh, Dr. Jean Hurtbeck to uh, take over the digital space and uh, enlighten us with her lecture. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak at this workshop. I, I really greatly appreciate this opportunity. Uh, so my, my talk today is entitled, uh, What Causes Aftershocks? And so first, why do, why do we care about aftershocks? And we care about aftershocks because aftershocks can be damaging and deadly. They can be just as damaging and deadly or even more so sometimes than main shocks. This is a few examples here of um, aftershocks that were quite deadly. The, the top photo is from Christchurch, New Zealand, um, where the dust you can see is the dust rising from, from damaged buildings following a magnitude 6.2 earthquake that was an aftershock. And it was much more damaging than main shock. The main shock was in a less populated area, and the aftershock happened to occur um, right in the city of Christchurch, making it much more um, damaging and deadly than its main shock. Uh, yes, yesterday we had a, a very enlightening talk about the 2015 Nepal earthquake, and it was noted that that earthquake had a large aftershock, a magnitude 7.3, that um, while it wasn't as bad in, as the main shock in terms of, of how deadly and destructive it was, it was still quite bad. And the bottom, the bottom photo is from the tsunami after the magnitude 9 Tohokuoku, Japan earthquake, which was not an aftershock exactly, but it was preceded by foreshocks. So it falls into that category 
of events that were triggered by prior events and ended up being much more of a deadly disaster than the, than the first event. So this motivates us to study aftershocks to try to understand why they happen, when and where they happen, so that we can attempt to forecast them and attempt to mitigate um, this damage that they can cause. So, Um, before I start in with the talk, I'm just going to talk briefly about the definitions of foreshocks, main shocks, and aftershocks. Um, they're all earthquakes, and they don't have any real obvious differences to them. If you were shown some waveforms of an earthquake, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell if it was a main shock, foreshock, or aftershock, because those terms really just refer to when these earthquakes occur relative to each other in a sequence. The main shock being the largest magnitude earthquake in the sequence, the foreshocks being the smaller events that occurred before, and the aftershocks being the smaller events that occurred after. And this is a plot of a 2020 sequence of earthquakes in Puerto Rico um, that had a lot of foreshocks leading up to the magnitude 6.4 main shock. And during the sequence before the main shock happened, we would have called the largest of the four shocks the main shock. And then when the main shock occurred, we have to change what we labeled each earthquake. So a main shock, a four shock, and aftershocks, to some extent, is really just um, sort of semantics. But what we do know is that these earthquakes occur clustered together. And in particular, when we have a large earthquake, it does trigger a lot of following earthquakes, be they, more, be they aftershocks or be they another main shock. So we want to understand how this triggering of aftershocks occurs. So just some basic characteristics of aftershocks, looking at a couple of sequences in California, a magnitude 6.7 earthquake versus a magnitude 5.1. You can see that the magnitude 6.7 um, triggers many more aftershocks. You can see that those aftershocks decay with time. But importantly, we can also see that while many aftershocks are small, even late in the sequence, it is possible to have large aftershocks. So we do need to be alert for aftershocks. Any, any time during an aftershock sequence, we need to be alert for larger aftershocks. And we need to understand, understand where and when these late aftershocks might occur. So this is a, a table from a paper by, by Andy Michael, who many of you know through his um, participation in organizing these workshops. This is a paper where he calculates, given the statistics of aftershocks, how likely there is to be a damaging aftershock during various stages of response and recovery from a main shock. So for a magnitude seven main shock during the first couple of weeks, which he's labeled the emergency response period where, where things like search and rescue and firefighting are, are occurring. The probability of having a magnitude six or larger aftershock is pretty high, that it's about 60%. During a restoration over say a year or so, there's still a 30% chance of having a large aftershock that could in itself be large enough to do damage and seriously disrupt uh, restoration. Even during some longer time periods of reconstruction and betterment that may last years or decades, there's still about a 10% chance that a large disruptive aftershock could occur. So this is hopefully motivated for you why, why we need to um, seriously understand where, when, and why aftershocks occur so that we can attempt to forecast them and attempt to mitigate some of the damage they, they cause and um, keep them from disrupting these response and recovery activities following a main shock. So, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, three aspects of triggering of aftershocks. I'm going to talk about the Coulomb rate and state model, which is kind of the current state of the art model for understanding when and where aftershocks occur. I'm going to talk about static stress triggering versus dynamic stress triggering, which has been um, a long term uh, fascinating debate about aftershock triggering. And I'm also going to talk about the effects of some background conditions, the effects of the background stress state that exists before the main shock and um, background structures, kinematics, heat flow and other properties that exist before the main shock and may affect when and where aftershocks occur. There are, of course, many other physical mechanisms that affect aftershock occurrence, uh, but in uh, a single talk, it's, it's sort of impossible to, to talk about everything. Um, 
So certainly also important is changes in fluid pressure, uh, uh, things like um, post-seismic deformation, after slip. So there's many, many aspects of, of triggering of aftershocks, but today I'm going to talk about these three particular aspects of the triggering of aftershocks. So um, many of you are are probably familiar with um, Coulomb stress change. Uh, static Coulomb stress change is um, one of the most widely used and very successful models that uh, can forecast where aftershocks are likely to occur. It's called static because it's the stress change that's permanent or mostly permanent that's left over after the seismic waves have gone through. And it's defined as the shear stress change on a receiver fault um, plus the normal stress change on that fault multiplied by an effective coefficient of friction. And given this definition that it, it's the shear stress change in the direction of slip, that can be positive or negative depending on what the, the slip direction of that fault is. And the normal stress can also either clamp the fault shut to keep it from slipping or can um, can kind of open the fault up and make it easier to slip. So this gives you reason, regions around the main shock where the stress is increased, it's loaded the faults. We expect aftershocks and subsequent large events to occur in these areas that have been loaded with stress and in these um, stress transfer diagrams that, that are frequently plotted, these are the red areas. And then there's also areas where the faults have been moved away from failure. And these are the purple areas where we would expect to have fewer aftershocks. So uh, this has been a very successful model. It um, really started out in the, the 90s. This is one of the first papers to show how well it works. Looking at the stress changes on faults around San Francisco following the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake and looking at the rate change of earthquakes and finding that there is actually a correlation between this change in Coulomb stress and the change in the seismicity rate. Another interesting aspect of um, static Coulomb stress change is the idea of stress shadows. So these are these purple regions where the stress on the major faults has been decreased. So we would expect um, fewer or no aftershocks to occur, and we would expect possibly even normal earthquake activity to be suppressed for a time. And this is actually something that's been observed. This is the, uh, what's termed as a stress shadow, where there's a lack of earthquakes for a while. This has been observed um, in the top right figure here following the 1906 um, magnitude 8-ish earthquake that occurred around San Francisco for a period of time after 1906. There were many fewer earthquakes in the San Francisco area than there were in the in the decades before. And the bottom figure is a, is a similar diagram for the 1857 earthquake that occurred near Los Angeles, also about a magnitude eight. And in that time frame, there in the time frame of about 50 years after that earthquake, there were no other earthquakes occurring in the modeled stress shadows where the where the um, Coulomb stress change decreased. Um, although there were still some earthquakes occurring in the regions where it increased. So uh, the existence of these stress shadows is a, another um, strong piece of evidence that this static Coulomb stress change is important. So, what, so that explains the locations of aftershocks, but what explains uh, when they occur? And it's been known for a long time since this work by Omori on the 1891 Nobi Japan earthquakes that the rate of aftershock decays with a power law with time. And the Nobi earthquake is particularly impressive. Um, Utsu came back um, 100 years later and showed that this, uh, this power law decay of the earthquake rate from this Nobi Japan earthquake was visible for 100 years. So this has been observed for many earthquakes since then and is now referred to as the Omori law of aftershock decay. Um, but what can physically explain this? It turns out that one possible physical explanation for this Omori law decay comes from the laboratory derived rate and state friction. So rate and state friction is just saying that the friction of a fault is not always constant. It evolves with time. And two of the things that affect its evolution with time is the rate, which is the rate at which the fault is slipping, and the state. And the state in this model represents the state of the frictional contacts between two sides of the fault. And in particular, um, those 
contacts, those frictional contacts evolve with time. And then the lower left here is an image of um, frictional contacts evolving with time as two um, pieces of material are left in, in contact. So the rate and state friction laws derived from these laboratory experiments, um, Jim Dietrich in this 1994 JGR paper showed that the rate and state friction law can explain this Omori decay of aftershocks because it adds a time dependent aspect to the friction. And it also does a good job of explaining the observed earthquake rate. That is this model can predict um, uh, the ratio of the number of aftershocks to the background rate or the rate change. And this model has been shown to work very well. When you combine the static Coulomb stress change and the rate and state friction model um, to come up with what's been referred to as the Coulomb rate and state model, it's been shown that this model um, fits the occurrence of aftershocks very well. And um, while this, these models were derived mostly in the 90s, they've been continued to be updated through the present day. Um, and recent work has shown that these models can be improved um, simply by using better source models, incorporating the uncertainty in the source models, um, better modeling the receiver fault, not receiver faults, better incorporating their uncertainty, and incorporating things like secondary triggering. And this is an example of a of a bunch of Coulomb rate and state models for the Central Italy earthquake sequence where um, more and more complexity has been included in the model with better source models, receiver models, secondary triggering. And on the right, each of these models is compared to each other using the information gain, which is a measure of how well each model does predicting the location of future uh, aftershocks. And as the models go from left to right, they get more and more complex and you can see that the information gain improves. So adding this realistic complexity to the, to the models can improve, uh, per, improve the performance of the models. So um, this Coulomb rate state model is um, a very good model in explaining the locations and times of aftershocks, but there are still a few um, outstanding questions. And the first question is why do aftershocks occur in these stretch shadows? That you can see a, a scattering of the white squares that are aftershocks in these purple regions, which are the stress shadows, where the stress on the major faults has been decreased and we would not expect to see very many aftershocks. And one hypothesis about uh, why these aftershocks might occur in the shadows is dynamic stress triggering. So I'm gonna look into that, um, look into that possibility a little bit more in this talk. And there's also the question of why aftershocks are so clustered, that they do occur mostly in these red regions where the stress is increased, but they don't just uniformly fill those regions. They instead occur in some very tight clusters, and there's some large red areas that are completely devoid of aftershocks. So we would like to understand why aftershocks occur in some of these red regions, but not others. And I'm gonna explore the idea that this has something to do with the background properties that existed before those stress changes were imposed upon. So first I'm gonna discuss um, static versus dynamic stress triggering and this issue of stress shadows. So just to quickly define them, the static stress change is the permanent stress change. Uh, and this decays quite rapidly with distance away from the fault, whereas the dynamic stress changes are the transient stress changes from the passing seismic waves, which decay much more slowly with distance, and so we would expect to see dynamic triggering at greater distances from a fault. And we do, in fact, see this. This is a paper showing uh, triggering of aftershocks or distant triggered events all over California and Nevada following an earthquake in California. And in this paper, they showed that when you filter um, the seismograms, you can pick out some local high frequency earthquakes occurring, um, occurring, starting to occur right as the surface waves and even the S waves of the main shock come through. So, and because this triggering is happening at very large distances from this earthquake, it must be due to the dynamic stresses because the static stresses would die out uh, and be too small. Um, dynamic stress triggering also leads to asymmetry in triggering due to di directivity. If you have an earthquake, you, you will have a uh, higher amplitude ground motion in the direction of rupture. And we do see that in, in triggering. 
the left two panels here are two magnitude seven earthquakes that occurred in Southern California in very similar locations, uh, one rupturing mainly to the south and one to the north. And the one to the north triggered many, many more earthquakes to the north than the one rupturing to the south. And the south arguably triggered a southward rupturing one arguably triggered a few more earthquakes to the south. Uh, the Nanali earthquake in Alaska also caused triggering all over um, the west coast of Canada and the United States because of its directivity pointed in that direction. So, so the last few figures I've shown look at dynamic, dynamic triggering at a distance, but there's also a debate about whether or not dynamic triggering is important in the near field, that is in, within um, a fault length or two of a main shock. And there's been a debate about this, uh, particularly focused on these plots of number of aftershocks with distance from the main shock. And when this, when this was first studied, this was thought to be evidence for dynamic triggering, because we would expect um, dynamic triggering to produce um, approximately a power law decay with distance. And um, also the argument that a simple power law suggests a single triggering mechanism over a range of distances. However, on the right, it was also shown that one could get one of these power law decays from static triggering only if there's um, secondary triggering contaminating the signal. So this, this, um, this debate ended up being fairly inconclusive, but I think also has left sort of an un what I, I feel is, is sort of an unhelpful framing of um, dynamic stress triggering versus static stress triggering when it seems very likely that both are involved. And this was the tactic taken by this work um, by van der Alsten Brosky to look at um, uh, near field and far field triggering together. So in this plot, they, they plot the triggering intensity versus the peak dynamic strain for far field triggering shown in red and near, figure, near field triggering shown in blue. And if they extrapolate the um, far field triggering into the near field, that far field triggering, which of course must be dynamic triggering, would be that dynamic triggering would be responsible for something like 15 to 60% of the near field aftershocks. So they propose this model where the near field triggering is a combination of both dynamic and static. So um, in, a, in a paper that uh, my colleague Ruth Harris and I just published in the Seismic Record, we look at the static versus dynamic or static and dynamic stress triggering problem from the point of view of stress shadows. Stress shadows being these features that are um, fairly strongly associated with static triggering because the dynamic triggering we expect to be um, positive everywhere and not producing regions where earthquakes are inhibited. In the top, in the top figures here, I've shown the predicted rate of aftershocks for three magnitude seven earthquakes in California, um, just following the static Coulomb stress change model. And it includes uh, some very large stress shadows, which so is shown in sort of the pink purple color that are regions where we're expecting very few aftershocks. However, in the bottom figures, we look at the actual number of aftershocks and we don't see those, um, we don't see those stress shadows at all. So that, the question is then why, why is that? Um, why are aftershocks occurring in these stress shadows and what are the characteristics of these earthquakes? So we looked at the earthquakes occurring in the stress shadows and the stress increase regions separately. And here we here I've plotted the aftershock rate um, rate change from the background rate. So one means there was no change in rate before or after the earthquake versus the um, absolute value of the static stress change. And I plotted in red the stress increase regions and in blue the stress shadows. And the first thing you can see is that there is a stress shadow in the sense that there's about an order of magnitude more aftershocks in the stress increase regions than there are in the shadows. And the stress increase regions are fit very well by the Coulomb rate and state model. That's the dashed line. So the red dashed line fits very well to the red uh, points. 
However, the blue dash line is the prediction for the column rate and state model in the stress shadows, and that predicts a um, drastic decrease in rate um, in the shadows, whereas that's not what we see. We actually see an increase in rate in the shadows. So if we make a slightly different plot where we plot the aftershock rate over the background rate, this time versus distance from the fault, we can see it's fit pretty well by simple power law that is um, one over the distance squared. And this is consistent with dynamic triggering from near field body waves. So um, in the stress increase regions, there's not a clear power law decay. So we see that there's really a different spatial distribution and spatial decay in the shadows versus the stress increase regions that's implying different triggering processes. That's implying Coulomb rate and state in the stress increase regions, but dynamic triggering in the shadows. If we look at temporal changes uh, in rate, we also see a similar, similar thing shown here is the cumulative number of aftershocks with time in the upper panels in the stress increase regions, which again are fit very well the, by the Coulomb rate state model, the dashed red lines. In the bottom panel are, is the um, cumulative number of aftershocks in the um, stress shadows. And instead of having the Amori decay that we see from the Coulomb rate and state model, what we see is an initial burst of aftershocks over the first few days or couple of weeks. And I've shown in the inset some um, zoomed in on the first uh, 90 days so you can see really how sharp that initial burst is. And then it dies down to a kind of a constant background rate. And an initial burst is, of course, also consistent with dynamic triggering because we expect most of that triggering to happen as the se seismic waves come through um, and maybe shortly thereafter if those seismic waves have changed some things like the, like the local fluid pressure. So again, we see some different temporal uh, characteristics of the stress shadow region versus a stress increase region that really implies a different type of triggering process. So if we assume all the aftershocks in the, in the shadows are dynamically triggered, and we also assume that there's a similar number of dynamically triggered earthquakes in the stress increase regions, we just can't see them because they're being overwhelmed by all the aftershocks that are being triggered by the static stress changes. We can back out what fraction of the, of the total aftershocks are dynamically triggered, and we estimate about a third are dynamically triggered. And we do a number of realizations of this calculation um, uh, varying some of the modeling assumptions, and we get a range of, of um, this estimated fraction of dynamically triggered that's in fact very similar to this range of 15 to 60 percent that van der Elst and Brodsky um, uh, obtained with, with a very different method. So this is two different, two very different approaches has come up with the same kind of hybrid static dynamic triggering model with about two thirds of, of aftershocks being triggered by the static model and one third by the dynamic model. And this can also Im improve our um, forecasts of aftershock locations compared to the Coulomb rate state model. This is showing the observed aftershock rate in the top panels and the, the hybrid model, the predicted from the hybrid model in the lower panels. And again, measuring the prediction power using this information gain, we can see we have very high information gains of this new hybrid model compared to the CRS model, uh, implying that this is this is um, very helpful in uh, forecasting the locations of the aftershocks. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about um, the effects of background conditions on aftershock occurrence. And I'm going to start by talking about uh, the impacts of the background stress field on aftershock occurrence. And, and the background stress field um, seems to me like should be particularly important in aftershock triggering if the main models of triggering are these stress change models, because these stress changes are, um, you know, additive with the background stress that's already there to bring, bring faults either towards or away from failure. And um, just a reminder, the, the static Coulomb stress change, you look at the shear stress change uh, on the receiver fault in its slip direction. And of course that slip direction is controlled by the background stress. The slip direction is the direction of the maximum shear stress. And if the background stress and the stress change have similar orientation, then this maximum shear stress aligns with the maximum stress change, maximum shear stress change, um, you know, additively together moving these receivers faults towards failure. 
whereas if the two stress tensors are poorly aligned, the stress change may be small or negative in the direction of the maximum stress that was there in the background field. So a little cartoon that, that hopefully will make, make this idea of the stress similarity being important a little bit more clear. In the left is the stress field uh, that we have uh, a very simple cartoon of a background stress field that's mostly a thrust faulting regime, a, a east-west thrusting regime, but has an area where there's some strike slip faulting as well. If you had a stress change over this region that was a strike slip type stress change that happened to be well aligned with this pre-existing stress field, these would add together to create a larger magnitude stress field of the same orientation of strike slip faulting and move these strike slip faults towards failure. Whereas this stress field may apply very little or maybe even negative shear stress onto these thrust planes, so we would not see a very large stress there and these faults wouldn't be moved as much towards failure. So what we would expect to see is even though we have a, fair, a homogeneous stress change over this whole region, we would get very clustered aftershocks in this region of the pre-existing strike slip uh, regime. And something like this is was actually seen um, in Japan following the Tohoku earthquake, that there were some regions of uh, onshore Japan that uh, were very much activated by this uh, Tohoku earthquake. Um, as a subduction zone earthquake, the stress change in the upper fault is an extensional and east-west extensional stress that wouldn't would unload most of the reverse faulting that occurs in Japan. However, it's found that these regions where there's a pre-existing normal faulting regime, where there is pre-existing east-west extension occurring, these regions really light up with aftershocks after the Tohoku earthquake. So this is um, very much implying that the similarity between the stress change and the background stress orientation has an impact on the location of aftershocks. I tested this out um, for four California earthquakes, looking at the locations of all the aftershocks and all of the background events, and looking at the similarity between the background stress and the applied stress change from the main shock. And plotting in red, uh, the similarity at the locations of all the aftershocks, and in blue, the similarity at the locations of the background events. And a higher um, stress similarity value means that the, the two stresses are more similar. And you can see that the red curves are all um, shifted to the right relative to the blue curves, implying that a lot more aftershocks are occurring in these regions where the stress change is similar to the existing background stress. Uh, this is the more recent uh, Ridgecrest earthquake in Southern California, where I looked at the rate change as a function of the stress similarity and found that the highest rate changes happened when the background stress and the applied stress change were more similar and the fewest aftershocks occurred where they were more different. So you might notice looking at that figure that where I plotted the stress similarity, a high stress similarity in red and a low stress similarity in blue, that these actually look fairly similar to the Coulomb type lobes and they actually have some of the same issues. Uh, in particular, that the aftershocks don't fill all of those um, red lobes, they occur in smaller clusters and there are parts of these red lobes with high stress similarity where there's very few or no aftershocks. So why is that? And for the Ridgecrest earthquake, there's a very particular example, which is the COSO geothermal region right here, which is um, active geothermal energy production. And this could be an abnormal region due to the anomalous temperatures and fluid pressures. So that brings us to the other sort of background conditions that we could, would expect could have an impact on the location of aftershocks. And this is things like background structure, kinematics, heat flow, rock type, et cetera. So it turns out that people have found that the heat flow affects the aftershock productivity. And the aftershock productivity is defined here as how many aftershocks a main shock produces. So, so productivity is kind of a, a, a function of the main shock. And 
it's it's shown here for five regions of Southern California that the higher the heat flow, the lower productivity and this highest heat flow, lowest productivity region is the COSA region, that geothermal region near the Ridgecrest earthquake. And this was a study before the Ridgecrest earthquake um, confirming uh, that was then confirmed by the Ridgecrest earthquake that these very high heat flow regions have the lowest uh, productivity. This was shown in, a, in another study that looks at uh, many more areas that there is a general um, decrease in aftershock productivity with heat flow. So this is implying that the higher the heat flow, maybe the weaker the rocks, the less, uh, the less stress they can um, maintain. And so they aren't able to build up enough stress to relieve in very many aftershocks. So there's also been studies of global variability in aftershock productivity that have found that there's um, quite a bit of variability in aftershock productivity um, with um, tectonic regime, um, even just with the simple strike slip versus uh, dip slip type of faulting regime. Um, also at uh, oceanic plate boundaries, there's a uh, uh, increase in productivity with the seafloor age. That is, um, when you have thicker and colder uh, seafloor, it can um, maintain a higher level of stress that then can produce more aftershocks when it's uh, when it's activated. So, so it does it does appear very much that the background conditions overall can in, impact the productivity of a given main shock. So there's also the issue, not just of the overall productivity of the main shock, but when the main shock produces its aftershocks, where do they all occur? And one thing that um, one thing has been noted is that the distribution of aftershocks um, does scale. Then the number of aftershocks does scale with the number of background events, which is exactly what would be predicted by the rate and state friction model. And this is a paper where Page and Vanderels look at a large number of small main shocks and stack um, both their background events and their aftershocks according to distance and according to azimuth. And for each distance bin, they sort the azimuthal bins to put the most um, the bins with the most background seismicity near the top of this graph and the bins with the least background seismicity near the bottom of the graph. And they take the very same bins and they count the number of aftershocks. And it turns out that these bins that up near the top that had the highest rate of background earthquakes also has the highest rate of aftershocks. Uh, this is shown as, as um, sort of a simple plot uh, uh, to the right where, where for all the distances they've, they've sorted the az azimuth by the background rate and then also plotted the aftershocks. So um, very consistent with rate and state, we can tell that the aftershocks are occurring in similar locations to where the background events occur. So I, I've been um, working on a project to look at the spatial distribution of aftershocks um, as a function of various uh, physical properties. Um, I've been working in Southern California where we have um, a lot of models for various physical properties of the crust. A lot of these have been compiled by the Southern California Earthquake Center, which is um, a concentration of academic and, and government scientists uh, and private industry scientists focused on, focused on understanding uh, earthquake activity in Southern California. And I'm fortunate to have all these data sets that they've collected that then I have compared to where aftershocks have occurred following some magnitude seven and greater earthquakes in Southern California. So the idea is to in investigate um, each of these physical properties and compare them with the aftershock rates following these main shocks. So to do that, I divide the aftershock zones into bins based on the value of the chosen physical property. There's a cartoon of that idea in the upper right, a, an aftershock zone divided into just four properties. For each of these zones, I then compute the ratio of the observed number of aftershocks to the predicted in that bin. And the predicted is just assumed to scale with the amplitude of the static stress change, which is shown in, which is shown in the figure in the lower right. 
And then I test whether this uh, ratio of the number of aftershocks to the number predicted is correlated with the value of a given physical property. So I've tested a lot of physical properties. I'm going to show you some where I've seen a good correlation. Uh, what's shown in each of these plots on the y-axis is this ratio of the number of aftershocks to the number predicted, so a higher ratio uh, implying that there's um, uh, more aftershocks than one might expect and a lower ratio implying there's fewer aftershocks than one might expect. Uh, plotted on the x-axis is these various um, uh, various properties. And the different colors and symbols are each of the four earthquakes, and the solid line is a very simple model um, fit to the correlation. The top two panels show that there's um, a clear decrease of aftershock rate with distance from the nearest mapped fault for two different fault, base, fault databases for California. And remember that the, that the base model that goes into the predicted number already includes the decay of aftershock rate with distance from the main shock fault. So this is saying that in addition to that, there's also more aftershocks occurring closer to the other mapped faults. The figure in the lower left shows the correlation of the aftershock, um, aftershock rate with the background seismicity rate, that, which we already um, saw that, that Paige and Van der Elst had, had determined that that these two things do scale, and I confirm that they scale, and I confirm that they're very similar um, to the one-to-one -one scaling that one would expect from uh, Dietrich's rate and state model. And in the lower right, we also see that the aftershock rate increases with the geodetically determined strain rate. Of course, some of these properties may be correlated. Of course, there may be a higher geodetic strain rate nearer to some of the mapped faults, but we can see each of these correlations individually for these different properties. I also see that the aftershock rate is correlated with um, seismic velocity and heat flow. Uh, the left two panels here are the P wave velocity from a, a seismic tomography model and the density from the same tomography model, which is why, why they the two look very similar. And on the right is heat flow. And I found for these properties that there's not so much a correlation as there is a range of preferred values. And these range of preferred values are sort of the middle, middle values of each of these, suggesting that you know, rocks at the extremes are either kind of too strong, they're too cold and dense to fail easily, or they're too weak, that they're too kind of hot to accumulate much strain to release in aftershocks. And notice for the heat flow, um, the prior work had found uh, an inverse correlation between uh, the aftershock productivity and the heat flow. So I, I see that at higher heat flow values, um, but those studies didn't test many very low heat flow values like what I see here. So they couldn't have tested whether the, the aftershock productivity went back down at those low heat flows. So, so these results are, are consistent with, with those prior results. Now, when we think about things like the P wave velocity and the heat flow, and the heat flow is the heat flow observed at the surface, um, you know, these aren't the, the basic physical parameters that are controlling aftershock location at depth, right? These are, these are proxies for those controlling factors. These are proxies for temperature, rock composition, fluid content, um, rheological properties, rock type, et cetera, that maybe do actually control the aftershock occurrence. However, even though there are some models available for, for California for um, these properties, unfortunately, I don't see a good correlation with any of these properties like temperature, various geological properties, and rheology properties. Um, on the upper left is uh, shows the aftershock rate as a function of temperature at seismogenic depth. There's no correlation of present apparent there. Um, the upper right figure, aftershock rate as a function of rock type, where I've just quantified that as the, the fraction mafic of, of that particular rock type. Uh, again, no cor clear correlation. And the lower left is an upper crustal shear modulus coming from a tomography model. There's the vaguest hint of a, of a, a, a decrease with um, increasing shear modulus just for one of the earthquakes. Uh, sequences, but not for the other three. And for the low, lower crystal viscosity, there's also no 
no correlation. So, so this is really disappointing because these would be the types of properties that one would think would be um, actually directly controlling whether aftershocks could occur at that location. And unfortunately, we don't see these correlations. Um, one of these reasons, one of the reasons for that, I believe, is that these properties are, of course, all very difficult to measure or infer at seismogenic depths and particularly at the kind of kilometer scale resolution that we would need to really um, correlate with the, you know, sub kilometer resolution we have in, in aftershock locations. So I think, um, you know, while this is a negative result, I think uh, it strongly suggests that this is the sort of, of study that could, should be revisited in the future um, when these uh, types of properties can be uh, better, better measured at seismogenic depths. So the, the properties that do correlate with aftershocks, uh, we can make a, a spatial kernel out of them, which is just uh, based on the relation between that, that property and the the ratio of the number of aftershocks to predicted um, and plot that ratio of number of aftershocks to predicted. Um, I've included in the upper left just the, the normalized Coulomb stress, and you can see that that looks like the, that familiar kind of lobe, lobe pattern of Coulomb stress. Um, stress similarity next to it looks very similar. But then some of these upper, other properties, the distance to the nearest fault, background seismicity rate, shear strain rate, heat flow all look very different, indicating that, that these properties are um, describing different contributions to the aftershock location. And so these can all be combined together and combined with that base model for a new model of the aftershock locations, and that's what's shown on the left. And if we do a, a retrospective test showing how well these models uh, explain the aftershock locations. This information gain shows that um, this is an improvement over that base model. Uh, however, there's still a ways to go. Uh, shown here is, is a residual map of the difference between the modeled number of aftershocks and the actual number of aftershocks. And you can see in particular, there's some uh, dark blue areas that represent dense after aftershock clusters that still aren't very well explained uh, by this model. So we still need to further understand why these dense aftershock clusters occur. And this is even after um, taking out secondary triggering. Um, as I noted, at some point, we need to revisit the correlation of aftershocks with things like temperature and rheological properties um, when we can actually measure these, these properties at seismogenic depths at higher resolution. And of course, um, these sort of background uh, background stress and background property models need to be integrated with the static and dynamic stress triggering models that I talked about in the first half of this talk. So um, there's certainly a lot of work still to be done. As, as I mentioned, I also in, in this talk um, didn't get to even really talking about the effects of um, poor, poor pressure changes, poor elastic changes after slip, um, uh, viscoelastic relax relaxation and, and those types of um, physical mechanisms on aftershocks. Um, so, you know, I would say there's still there's still a lot to be done in understanding the physical mechanisms of aftershocks, why they occur, where and when they do. And I certainly encourage anybody looking for projects <laughs> that that um, trying to understand aftershocks is a very uh, fruitful um, and and interesting um, uh, course of research. Um, so I'm just going to uh, summarize um, summarize what I've talked about today. Uh, I started by talking about Coulomb and Coulomb rate and state uh, stress triggering, which is a model that combines um, this Coulomb stress change idea that maps where aftershocks occur with this laboratory rate and state model that can explain the temporal evolution of the aftershocks. And this model uh, is kind of our current state-of-the-art model for understanding um, aftershock triggering, and it is a good description in general of the spatial and temporal characteristics of aftershocks. However, it doesn't explain everything. 
For example, um, it doesn't explain the very tight spatial clustering of aftershocks that we observe or why there's these gaps where there's a stress increase and no aftershocks occur. And it also doesn't explain why aftershocks occur in stress shadows where the stress should be relaxed. So then I talked a bit about uh, static versus dynamic stress triggering and um, showed evidence uh, that both static and dynamic stress changes appear to influence near field aftershocks and um, that the aftershocks occurring in the stress shadows are very consistent with dynamic triggering. They have a power law decay like you would expect, and they also occur in a very brief burst over a few days to a couple of weeks, which is also what we would expect from dynamic triggering. And then I've talked about the effects of background conditions and shown that, excuse me, that shown that more aftershocks occur where the background seismicity rate is higher, which is something we would expect from the rate and state model. More aftershocks occur where the stress change is similar in orientation to the background stress because those two stresses added together reinforce each other and apply more total stress to these faults, bringing them closer to failure. And I've also shown evidence that background properties such as crustal structure, kinematics, heat flow, um, faulting regime, et cetera, can impact the overall aftershock productivity of a sequence and can also, uh, can also um, impact the locations of the individual aftershocks of a particular main shock. Although there's still obviously a lot of work to be done on, on um, the effects of background conditions, particularly those that are um, very difficult to uh, measure or infer at seismogenic depths. So that's it. I wanna thank you very much again for this wonderful opportunity to give this talk and I um, welcome your, your comments and, and questions. I think I lost my screen there. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a wonderful lecture. Now, I would like to request the participants to please raise your hands if they have any query regarding this lecture. Uh, we may take one or two questions at the most. Uh, in, however, in the mean, uh, meanwhile, we are glad to have amongst us Dr. Julian Boomer from Imperial College, London. Uh, may I request Dr. Boomer to provide his remarks on this session? Over to you, sir. Dr. Boomer. Uh, I think he's uh, facing some technical issues. Uh, so now uh, I'd like to re may I request uh, our session chairperson, Professor J.R. Kayal, sir, to provide his remarks on this session. Over to you, sir. Sir, please, please unmute, sir. Sir, please unmute your audio. Thank you so much and hearty congratulations, Dr. Hardiwek. It was a wonderful, very comprehensive lecture on, on aftershock dynamics. You have given us such a comprehensive, uh, you know, details of the aftershock's behavior. I think I have no words. I think I have, I have listened to a most educative lecture you know, one of the most educated lectures in my life. <laughs> you have given your every slide is like a thesis. Anyway, so you have given us uh, quite a bit of you know uh, knowledge about the dynamics of aftershocks. I have a query. Maybe you have touched upon that, but still I have a uh, candid query. Whether we cannot predict or forecast men's shock but whether it is possible to predict aftershock with time and magnitude may, may not be the far field, but the near field aftershocks. 
uh, with the uh, largest aftershocks, near field largest aftershocks with time and magnitude, whether it is possible, uh, uh, you know, in, in future or you are heading towards that. That will be wonderful to know. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Harabek, please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's that's a good and very important question if we're ever going to be able to mitigate the hazard from, from the aftershocks. Um, I don't believe we can do that now. Currently, we can forecast the number of aftershocks that you would expect to vary its sizes. We can forecast the duration of the aftershocks. We can make some statements about where aftershocks are likely to occur. We can also make some statements about the likely largest magnitude the the largest magnitude aftershock is most likely to be about one magnitude unit lower than than the main shock but unfortunately at this time we can't predict the time and location of that largest aftershock and we can't predict how many large aftershocks that might be large enough to be damaging but i think we are making more progress towards that than, as you say, attempting to predict the main shocks, which is a much, much harder problem. Um, because aftershocks in a way are predictable and that we know when we have a main shock, we will have aftershocks. So we have a little bit more of a start on that than attempting to predict the main shocks. But I think, no, with our current with our current knowledge, I don't, I don't think we can yet yet predict the, the time and location and magnitude of those very large aftershocks. So th thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you so much. I have got another small query. Uh, do you you have shown many aftershocks, far field aftershocks? You have explained us, but uh, is there any no limit to the distance from the main shock epicenter? How far? How much distance away these you know far field aftershocks can be observed? Is it, does it depend upon the main shock uh, uh, magnitude and any any distance means it 100 km or 200 km or 1000 Yes, please. Oh, I, I, I think there's a little bit of interference on, on my microphone here. Um, so my, my colleague Fred Pollitz has actually observed um, aftershocks occurring on the other side of the world, these these very distant aftershocks occurring on the other side of the world in a very particular location that there was this um, strike slip earthquake offshore Sumatra that um, yes, yes, being very yes. large and yeah. strike slip happened yes. to yes. send the energy you know, very yes. optimally around the world to be yes. focused on the other side of the world. Yes, yes. So, so that's the farthest I'm I'm yes. aware of. So that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um. yes. Uh, okay, that 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 we understand. Maybe a you know trigger earthquake, it, another main shock triggered by the uh, mega earthquake. But I was wondering whether sequence of aftershocks, uh, you know, just uh, far field sequence of aftershocks by a main shock. That was uh, actually I was uh, querying. Anyway, thank you very much for a very, very detailed lecture. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Over to Anesha, please. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, now may, I, uh, may I request Honorable Director of BGRL from Ministry of Earth Sciences, Dr. Sukanta Roy, to provide his remarks on this session. Over to you, sir. Well, good morning. Uh, uh, I am really fascinated with this lecture. I was uh, listening to this lecture uh, very intently, uh, although and uh, although just like a student because I am not an expert in this in this game. But what I what I what I found very uh, uh, something that relates to our program is the uh, are the are the are the control of certain parameters in. Uh, uh, in, uh, to for the aftershock occurrence, such as temperature, rock composition, and rheological properties at depth, and these remain as major challenges as as John Hardebeck mentioned uh, to measure at seismogenic depths. And I think that's one area where these uh, scientific drilling programs, such as the SAFERD and the COINA, can 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 play a major role. I think we should make uh, attempts 
to devise ways and techniques to 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 constrain such parameters uh, uh, which are really difficult to to measure otherwise i mean uh, we have we definitely need lab experiments but nothing like measurement in c2 so that's that's just my comment um, otherwise i i'm i'm really glad that i was uh, party to this lecture today thank you thank you sir now uh, may i request our session co chairperson dr vivid suryanto from ugm indonesia to say a few words on this session over to you sir thank you anvesha uh, good morning uh, dr hadrbeck uh, it is nice to to see you although only virtually <laughs> and again uh, i would like to say this is very wonderful uh, presentation uh, about the uh, the aftershock uh, dynamics uh, i also uh, intend like uh, like a students uh, learning <laughs> about earthquake and the aftershock especially um in our uh, people usually uh, they have uh, always asking about uh, the the life of the aftershock is do you have any recommendation to answer when a kind of uh, earthquake happens and how long it will be uh, stay until um, the rate is very very low do you have any uh, comment about this Yeah, I mean that that's always a very very important question of how long the aftershocks are going to last and um we can you know we can use that omori decay to estimate at what point the aftershocks might decay down to background um although we do observe in practice that there's this large variability in productivity of um, various sequences, but I think once once we have an idea of how productive a particular aftershock sequence is, uh, we can attempt to you know just project that decay into the future um, to make an estimate of of how long the the aftershock sequence might last. And um, unfortunately, those those times are often often very long for for a large productive aftershock sequence. Those that may be decades until the the rate is actually all the way back down to to background. Um, but you can also say estimate uh, the time until the probability of a magnitude five is below some threshold. Um, it's yeah, it's 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 really hard to pinpoint exactly what is the right metric of of when when the aftershock sequence is over, but but you can try to try to make those estimates just from the the Omori decay, and um, the USGS has actually done that um, a few times for some aftershock sequences in the United States. The the Federal Emergency Management Agency has asked us to try to do that to help them um, plan their emergency response. So we've attempted we've attempted that a few times. Okay. So thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, also unique uh, experience uh, in Lombok earthquakes in 2018 uh, because once like a six uh, point something earthquake happens, and we suppose that the aftershock will be below below this uh, magnitude, but then after several days, it is uh, even higher uh, earthquakes uh, happens in the the area. Uh, so it is also difficult uh, to. Uh, decide whether this is the mind shock or it's still somehow force shock <laughs> until all the the uh, cyclist is, is finished. Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harbeck. Uh, nice to see you again, uh, and I will give time back to Anvesta. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we have a few uh, queries from the audience uh, who have raised your hand. Now, uh, may I request Dr. Manoj Kumar Fukon to please uh, unmute and uh, ask your query. Over to you, uh, Dr. Manoj Kumar Fukon. Hello, uh, Madam Harbeck. It's an excellent lecture. We are really benefited and uh, enjoyed your lecture. Actually, uh, it's a pretty learning experience. And congratulations for the excellent deliveries. Uh, actually, uh, you have shown that uh, in many 
are in case of many earthquakes uh, in the stress shadow area where the aftershocks would be very less uh, there you have encountered a large number of aftershocks and regarding this you have encountered uh, a co compared it with the heat flow lithology and statistics and dynamic stress and sometimes you have found some correlation with it and 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 but still you are not being able to uh, say anything uh, very definitively However, uh, have you gone through the structural, existing structural complexity of the area? Uh, can it play any role uh, for the occurrence of uh, large numbers of uh, uh, aftershocks in the stress shadow area? This is my simple query, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, thank you. That's that's a, a good idea. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how to, to measure exactly the, the complexity, but there must be some way to, to measure that and attempt to, to correlate like I attempted with the other the other properties. Thank you. That's that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now. Uh... May I request uh, Kunal Modak to please unmute yourself and ask your query. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I'm uh, Chitranjan. Actually, uh, that, uh, listening with Kunal Modak, uh, Madam, it is uh, now it is here. Here, audible, man. Hello. Uh, you are your not very clear. clear. Yeah. Hello, Chitranjan. You can speak a little louder. Yes. Yeah, 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 madam. Uh, actually, it was very nice talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, one was uh, that my doubt that is any uh, that uh, model given by that Moggy one and two. So they are having uh, any means uh, that uh, this type of model having uh, this we have tested like this one in Euro studies. Yeah. Hello, madam. Hello. Your I'm, audio I'm sorry. Is not very clear. Yeah, your I'm sorry. Your audio is not very clear. Are Are you asking? Uh, uh, you said Mogi. Are you asking about the Mogi Donut? Yeah, the Mogi two, uh, one two model have this. So they have they, that model also explained that uh, that there should be I mean, less number of uh, port socks and after socks. So those so model you have actually tested in your studies. Yeah, I, I I haven't I haven't tested those specific models now. Yeah, yeah. But they're 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 very interesting and and certainly worth thinking about. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, due to scarcity of time in our schedule, uh, we are unable to take any further queries. Uh, so I'd like uh, to request all the attendees. Alisa, uh, yes, Alisa, you can take only one more question from Singham, Dr. Singham. Okay. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Chingtham Prasanta Singh, uh, you may please unmute yourself and ask your query. Are you there, Dr. Chingtham? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, close, thank yes. you, Madam, for your wonderful yeah. uh, presentations. Madam, my question is, uh, uh, what is the? Uh, 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 can we? Can you? We you? Uh, we use uh, this ITAS model, epitopic type aftershock sequence for aftershocks uh, after the last earthquakes. Or uh, how? Because uh, lots of researchers are mm, pursuing this kind of model modeling uh, in the. For last earthquakes, so uh, it, it is more. Can you throw some comments on this uh, model for earthquake predictions, madam? Yeah, of course. The 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 ETAS model and other statistical models are also very powerful models for um, describing and forecasting earthquake occurrence. Um, However, most of the spatial kernels that uh, go with these models are um, usually just radial symmetric kernels, so they don't 
include a lot of these things that we know are affecting aftershock rates, the, the stress changes, the background seismicity rate, the, um, you know, the other background properties like the, heat, the high heat flow areas and things like that. So I think the sorts of, a, sorts of um, research I'm doing here could also be used to improve the, the statistical models uh, like ETOS. But yes, the, the ETOS models and the, the best of the Coulomb rate and state models usually do um, sort of a similarly good job of explaining uh, aftershock sequences. So thank you for that question. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir, and thank you, ma'am. Uh, so with this, we would like to end the Q&A session here, uh, as we have a limited time in our schedule. So I would like to request all the other attendees who, uh, who have a query to kindly email it to us, and we will forward it to the concerned speaker and send your kind replies to your respective email IDs. Now, may I request uh, Mr. Prasujja Bordhakur to kindly deliver the vote, uh, vote of thanks. Over to you, Prasujja. Uh, thank you, Anisha. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, namaskar and good morning to all. As today's event has come to an end, it is my immense pleasure to convey heartfelt thanks to each and everyone on behalf of entire CSIR NIST family and the organizing member of IBW GST 2022. I'd like to take this op opportunity to thank Dr. Jean Hardyback for accepting our invitation and delivering such an educative talk on what causes aftershocks. Thank you once again, ma'am, for such a wonderful and edifying lecture. It was a great pleasure to have you with us as a keynote speaker for this event. Our deep sense of gratitude and thanks goes to our honorable director, sir, Dr. Jean Arahi Sastriji for his tremendous support and guidance in each and every steps of the workshop. Our heartfelt appreciation goes to the international advisor, Professor Andrew J. Michael, USGS, and Professor Dapen Zhao, Tohoku University, Japan, for their thoughtful insight on the conduction of the live sessions. I further take this opportunity to express my profound gratitude to the session chairperson, Professor J. R. Kyle, sir, former Deputy Director General, GSI Government of India, and Sessions co person Dr. V. Chuyanto from UZM Indonesia, and Dr. Debojit Hazarika from Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology for providing needful guidance. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank today's uh, special guest, Dr. Sukanta Roy, Director, BGRL, Avijit Ghosh, University of California, Julian Bumo, Imperial College of London for their presence despite of their busy schedule. Once again, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Santanu Barwasa, convener of IBWGST 2022, for his devotion towards this international workshop. We sincerely thank him a lot for providing us this amazing platform to listen and interact with such a prominent intellectuals around the globe. A special thanks goes to the members of technical and organizing committee for their hard work and dedication. Last but not the least, I express my deep sense of appreciation to all the participants for their active participation in today's event, without whom the event is not possible. We, the IVWGST team, wish for your continued support throughout this event and look forward to see you all in our next session tomorrow, shortly at 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time, our keynote speaker for tomorrow's session will be Professor Lapen Chao from Tohoku University, Japan, and he will be delivering talk on seismic structure and dynamics of Japan's abduction zone. On this note, we're signing off from today's event. Namaskar and Dhanabad. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you, sir. So Thank, you, ma Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And I hope we will have uh, opportunities for further interactions. Thank you. Thank you all. See you, sir. Sure. Thank you for your kind presence. Thank you very much for your kind presence. Thank you. Carl, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carl, sir. This is Manoj. Great pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you.